Hello, this is a joint work with uh, my advisor, Mike Roslek at Oregon State University. Um, so private set intersection uh, refers to this problem of two or maybe more parties, each holding a set which they wish to keep private, but they still wish to learn the intersection of the sets. So uh, <clears throat> throughout this talk, I'll use the uh, terminology of a sender and a receiver, and they both provide their sets, but only the receiver learns the intersection. Uh, to motivate this, uh, one of my favorite applications of private set intersection is sort of this contact discovery uh, scenario where, say, like Signal has a big list of users, and then there's some new uh, customer that just signed up for the service, and the customer wants to learn which of its contacts use the Signal app. And so, but they, they don't necessarily want to reveal all their contacts, and Signal doesn't necessarily just want to publish the list of users. And so they can run a private set intersection protocol where uh, only the the user learns the other people that, are, that they know also on the service. And there are many other applications, but uh, I'll move on. Uh, one of our fundamental building blocks that we use is uh, oblivious transfer. And in this uh, sort of functionality, Alice on the left-hand side has two messages of strings, and Bob has a single bit C, and Bob wishes to learn MC, and nothing about the other message, and uh, Alice shouldn't learn uh, the C, C, the bit. Uh, so there are highly efficient and malicious, malicious secure protocols for this, and so it's sort of for this protocol, uh, and it motivates it f as the basis for private set intersection uh, that's practically uh, fast. Um, another one of our building blocks is known as a bloom filter. This is a data structure that's sort of similar to a hash table, uh, except for it only allows for testing of set membership, so is an item in my set. Uh, and it's parameterized by k hash functions, h1 through hk, and, uh, and a bit array uh, denoted here by b, which is initialized to all zeros. Uh, so to insert an item into this uh, bloom filter, you simply set all the uh, bit locations indexed by the hash functions to one. And you can repeat this operation for other, uh, other items simply just by repeatedly setting them to one, regardless of what they were before. And then not too hard to figure out. To test set membership, we simply do the same thing again. But now what we do is we take the bitwise, or the bit and of all these, and that reports whether an item is in the intersection or, or in the uh, bloom filter or not. <clears throat> so it's easy to see when you insert like n items into a bloom filter with sort of m slots, uh, there's no false negatives in that we always, if an item is in it, we always say yes, it's, it's there. Uh, but there is some sort of probabilistic property of whether for an item that hasn't been inserted, uh, we may falsely report it as being inserted. And this uh, sort of, but this bad case can be bounded to be negligible in uh, your security parameter. And like intuitively, what, we, what happens is that uh, at least one of the hash functions will likely hit one of the zeros. And we just make this event very likely for all uh, items which haven't actually been inserted. Uh, another cool property of bloom filters is that the bitwise and of two bloom filters is itself a valid bloom filter for the intersection of the two sets. So to see this, um, we can just take the and of these two bloom filters, and in fact, uh, A is the only item in the intersection, and you can see that we do still report that as A being in the bitwise and of them. However, there's some sort of additional information that's being leaked here, uh, particularly that like bit in the middle, which is a sort of randomly gets set to one, and if you think about like the simulation of this, uh, the simulator only knows the intersection itself, and so it wouldn't be able to set this know which bit to set additionally. And so this somehow inherently leaks more information than just the intersection itself. Um, Dong, Chen, and Wen in 2013 sort of saw this uh, optimization and sort of overcame this slight limitation by uh, adding some additional stuff. So here on the right, the receiver samples uh, <coughs> uh, generates our traditional bloom filter, and then on the left-hand side, the sender uh, generates uh, this uh, array of strings, of random strings, of the same length as the bloom filter. And then they perform an oblivious transfer for each of these rows, where the selection bit for the oblivious transfer is the bloom filter bit. And so by doing this, uh, the receiver picks up what's known as a garbled bloom filter, and uh, this is, so they, if they have a bit of one, they learn the message. Otherwise, they learn this bot string, which is just, think of an all zero string or anything that's not important. 
And now we have the sender on the left-hand side construct their own uh, standard bloom filter. And the final sort of brilliant thing that they saw is that you can XOR together these uh, messages that are indexed by the hash functions to create a sort of encoding of the corresponding value. So A is encoded as M0 XOR M5 due to the hash functions. And so then we can send over these encodings to the receiver. And because they use oblivious transfer to pick up all the messages that they are indexing, they can also generate the corresponding sort of set of encodings for their uh, items in their set. And as you can see, this uh, encoding for A is in both of these uh, encoded sets. And so you can sort of translate back to the original set what the intersection is. <coughs> so in the semi-honest setting, uh, it's not hard to see that this is secure against a semi-honest sender and that one way I like to explain it is all arrows leave the, the sender, so it can't leak any, any information. But intuitively, the OTs hide the selection bits, and so it's uh, great. And then it is also going to be made secure against a semi-honest receiver. Pretty much the only thing that they can do is that for some Y that's not in their set, they may be able to learn the, the encoding. Uh, so in this case, uh, encoding of Y prime is M3, X or M4. But as you can see, M4 isn't in the set of messages that they know. And in fact, Dong Chen Wen uh, showed that there's sort of an equivalence between the false positive rate in the, like a traditional bloom filter and this sort of style of attack. And so this can just be bounded to be negligible. And so in the semi-honest setting, everything works out great. Unfortunately, when we go to the malicious setting, things aren't uh, quite as nice as usual. Um, in particular, it's insecure against a re receiver. And once you see this attack, it's obvious. They could, instead of using zeros in many places, they can simply uh, always use the one string, uh, one bit, and pick up all the corresponding messages in there. And th therefore, they can simply probe for the uh, sort of brute force attack, this uh, x hat term, um, and uh, recover all uh, values. So uh, in their paper, the Zhang, Dong Chen Wen sort of proposed, first they proposed a semi-honest protocol, and then they sort of, in a property-based manner, uh, put forth a sort of a countermeasure to this attack, which, which they claimed to make it malicious secure. And their main idea was to restrict the receiver to only <coughs> using valid bloom filters. So here, this all one bloom filter isn't valid. And this, what this translates when you actually want to do it is that we want to make it roughly like half the bits uh, in this bloom filter be one and half zero. So their idea was to make the receiver prove their zero choice bits. Um, and by doing this, they have the sender first sample a uh, random key S, and then generate a secret sharing, or M over two out of M secret sharing of this uh, S term, denoted these SIs. And then we will encode, uh, instead of just transmitting nothing for the zero messages of the OT, we'll put these SI terms in there. And finally, we'll encrypt this final message under this sort of master secret S. And by doing this, to learn the intersection, the, uh, the receiver must decrypt this uh, X hat term. And however, they have a problem in that in all the places that they should have used zeros, they had used ones. And so they didn't get any of the secret shares of S and couldn't decrypt this. And so by adding this countermeasure, we forced the uh, <coughs> receiver to use many zeros and preventing the initial attack. Um, so one obvious question is, is this secure? And we did successfully force the receiver to only use roughly like half ones and half zeros. However, as we show in this work and in uh, another work by Lambake, uh, we, by doing this countermeasure, we actually introduce a selective failure attack on the part of a sender. So now it was insecure against the receiver, now we're insecure against the sender. And once you see it, it's pretty obvious. If they replace one of these uh, SI terms with a random string, R, and then if this R term gets picked up by the other party, they will try to use it as a part of the secret sharing, and the secret sharing will not de uh, uh, resolve to the correct uh, master secret S. And so the output of the intersection, if they pick up this, oops, if they pick up this uh, bad R term, will be the null set. And whether this succeeds or fails, uh, inherently depends on their full set Y, and therefore it can't be simulated because the simulator only knows the intersection and not necessarily the full set Y. So we uh, sort of tackle this problem in a different way by making um, 
making the receiver prove that they use zeros in an input, in, input independent way. So first we have the receiver uh, simply use all the uh, random bits instead of uh, bloom filter as before. And then, uh, and then we have the sender sample, uh, send over a challenge to reveal some subset of these OTs. And the receiver must prove that they used uh, zeros in many places. If they, if they see, so for example, we might challenge on these two, and we'd expect roughly half of them to be zeros. And, or in this case, they need to prove that they know R, R2. Um, and then we eliminate these uh, used up OTs and consolidate the remaining ones. But now we have another problem in that this doesn't f correspond to a, the bloom filter that we want to continue with the protocol. And so what we do is um, we, we, need, we first have the receiver construct the bloom filter that they wish to have. And then they send a random permutation that maps these random OTs to the desired bloom filter. And Intuitively, one way you can do this is just you keep picking random items and bringing them up to the top. And because they're sort of this randomized process, it doesn't actually reveal any additional information. And so now we arrive at the bloom filter that we desire, and we can simply complete the protocol as before. Um, so one challenge in making this technique work is that these random OTs and this cut and choose challenge may not result in exactly half ones and half zeros. Uh, so in the example I gave, of course, it works. But an equally likely example, you would get all ones. And the only sensible thing here would be to abort. And so we need some robust way to sample, uh, the, check these zero bits. And the, so one way to think about this is that we want to make sure the prop property that the probability of accusing the bad or good guy of cheating is negligible. And so because this is a randomized process, the number of zeros that we'll see is some, follows some sort of distribution centered at the expected value. Uh, but with, uh, and then if we see significantly fewer zeros, we're gonna just going to abort. And so it's pretty straightforward. All we need to say is that we need to bound the area below the, the abort threshold to be negligible. And turn off bounds uh, are the perfect tool for this. Uh, but the sort of other property that we need is that for a bad guy who, who may provide significantly fewer zeros, that we still catch them with a high probability. And if they just use a couple, few, fewer than specified, you know, it's gonna be hard to detect that. And so we asked the question is, if they use significantly fewer zeros, like how many can they get away with and uh, still uh, not succeed with anything but negligible probability? And so we can again apply a turnoff bound to figure out where that, uh, how far that distribution can be shifted to the left and recover this sort of T value, which is the, uh, proportional to the number of zeros that they can get away with. And so by doing this, uh, we can sort of bound the uh, advantage of the adversary and just sort of make sure that the bloom filter is large enough. And one w cool property of this is that in practice, we only need to check like 1% of all these OTs. And so it adds almost no overhead compared to the traditional uh, semi-honest protocol. And then uh, finally, I want to sort of switch uh, gears a little and talk about one of our assumptions that we rely on so the random oracle model. And to see this, one of the important properties that uh, uh, a simulator in the malicious setting must do is extract the uh, effective input of uh, the corrupt parties. And in this is case case, uh, we're considering a corrupt receiver. And what the simulator must do is like extract, first extract uh, what their input is, in this case y, and then send it on to the ideal functionality, this PSI box. And this is sort of the, the simulation-based proofs. And then this, this box gives back the intersection, which allows the completion of the simulation. And so that's what we want to do. But how, the question is, how do we extract this set y? Uh, the first thing you might observe is that we're doing these oblivious transfers, which uh, they f allow you to extract uh, the selection bits. And so we can learn the corresponding bloom filter that they were used. Uh, however, this turns out, although you might think it's all we need, it's not. Uh, the bloom filter by themselves are not invertible, uh, naturally at least. That is like, just given a sequence of ones and zeros that form a bloom filter, it's highly non-trivial to sort of find out what set it corresponds to. And that while there do exist invertible bloom filters, uh, to make the situation worse is that this bloom filter may not even correspond to uh, any set, in that the malicious adversary may just send you completely random messages, and the simulator somehow needs to interpret this as, uh, I guess, the null set. 
so that it seems very difficult. And so we take a slightly different route and we model these hash functions that map into the Bloom filter as the random oracle. And by doing this, we allow the simulator to observe the, which items were potentially inserted into this Bloom filter. And uh, it's in particular, um, so th first we observe which items were extracted or hashed with the random oracles, and then we check them against this Bloom filter. And this allows us to extract uh, sort of the set Y. Um, an important point to be made is that even if additional calls to this random oracle are made, if they weren't actually inserted into the Bloom filter um, itself, they won't get extracted. So it's this sort of two-stage uh, extraction, which then we can send to the ideal PSI and finish the simulation. Um, one, in, uh, oh yeah, one important property that I guess we use is that we don't require the uh, programmability of these random oracles. So it's sort of a weaker random oracle. We just need to be able to extract. Um, and then here I'd also like to note, uh, while we design a private set intersection protocol, another way to view sort of our, the core construction is as, as oblivious PRF proto uh, protocol, where an I, uh, one party provides a set and they get the PRF F evaluated at it, and the other party gets the function F itself. And so OPRFs are used pretty widely, I guess, in crypto, and so you might consider using uh, this sort of portion of our protocol. And then we, to turn it into PSI, you simply send over the final encodings. So keep that in mind. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, so we compare ourselves to uh, De Cristofaro, Kim, and Tudix of 2010 work, which is a malicious secure sort of Diffie-Hellman style uh, protocol. This, uh, they use exponentiation and s several zero-knowledge proofs for each item in the intersection. And uh, so this results in significantly more running time between like 135 times slower. And just because uh, this just goes back to like how much more efficient oblivious transfer is compared to uh, exponentiation. And then uh, <coughs> you could also consider the trade-offs between the amount of communication and running time. So shown at the, the bottom dot is uh, <coughs> their protocol. Uh, which requires significantly more time, but it's less, less data. And so there's some sort of trade-off here. Uh, if you measure it, it, we're 38 times faster, uh, but we still send 23 times more data. And this is for the 1 million size sets. And so there's a uh, little bit of trade-off here. And um, even if you, some uh, times these uh, exponentiations are inherently sort of paralyzable. So even if you add more threads though, uh, we still outperform the, the uh, competition. Um, and sort of an interesting uh, side note is that we, because we could, implemented the original uh, Dong Chen Wen paper, and somewhat surprising, the malicious variant, uh, somewhat surprising is that their protocol required significantly more time than all of them, even though it looks pretty similar. And this sort of comes back to the point that we're doing, in their protocol, that it required like, you know, 100 million out of 50 million secret sharing. So while secret sharing is inherently sort of fast, when you scale to that size, things slow down significantly. Um, so that was sort of an interesting side note that we observed, that our protocol is significantly faster than the previous one, even if uh, the previous one was insecure. Um, and then another interesting point to compare against, uh, in industry, uh, PSI is performed, but they use sort of tish Traditionally, they use an insecure variant where uh, you simply pl 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 uh, uh, put the items through a one-way function and then compare these. Um, unfortunately, this is insecure. You can like, launch brute force attacks and other things, uh, but it's interesting to compare against. And you, so you can see that we're, our protocol is still significantly slower than um, sort of this insecure industry privacy intersection. Um, but we're making a big step towards in the right direction. And we can also uh, compare against the semi-honest setting of um, these protocols use some different techniques, but they also build on an oblivious transfer. And so you can see um, that we do move quite a ways towards it, but there's still um, much more work to be done in this area, for in the malicious setting at least. <clears throat> and that uh, concludes my talk, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Ivan? So, I, I didn't understand the, the uh, input extraction. Because even if you know the order of all, mm -hmm. of course, this, this guy is going to actually put those ones in, in the room filter that comes from, from the hashes. I mean, why can't he just put uh, the ones he wants in the hashes? 
he he can um, he can and he uh, if he does he can uh, um, yeah so we just use the, the we observe the Oracle queries to get a, like a sort of condensed set of items that might be uh, in the Bloom filter and then we can test whether any of the Bloom filter bits in this um, have been set and this sort of there's there's a very subtle argument here that I sort of glossed over that is <laughs> why this works. But you can say that um, if none of the bits that are hashed into this, um, if none of the indices are set, if all of them are set to zero, then with high probability they, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, you, yeah, you can, you can just be confident that there's at least one message that they would not be able to recover because there's this XOR term. Christian? You used, uh, no, wait, for a, wait for a mic. <laughs> you used the signal messenger and the so-called insecure protocol where they hash phone numbers and then, then compare it on the server as an example, as a motivating example. However, that's a many-party protocol, many users, one service provider, and here you just have two. How, how would this look like, this protocol in the larger context? Um, I think it would just be, you just always run it with the signal service, because uh, they have, it's not necessarily like, yeah, the signal has a list of all users, and so and then, so you could just run it as a pairwise between you and the server. But the server should not know the phone numbers in this case. Well, uh, <laughs> I think they do though. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, then you you might need to add some indirection. That's future work. Just wondering, uh, the Samara Honest version of the Bloomfilter solution, how does that compare with sort of the state of the art Samara Honest? Um, it's like 40 times slower. Okay, so a lot slower. A lot slower, okay. yeah. And that's because the Bloomfilter is large? Or yeah, it's just the Bloomfilter has this like security parameter blow up, and so you have to do like the number of elements times the security parameter number of oblivious transfers versus uh, sort of these pinkest style. Uh, ones that are best in semi-honest setting just do one oblivious transfer per element. Mm 